With just 78 days until the general election, the Democratic Party will convene virtually for an unprecedented convention. Tonight, we will get a first glimpse of what a political convention will look like without the crowds, the balloons, and unscripted moments as the party gears up to formally nominate former Vice President Joe Biden for president. For more on what we can expect, expect, let's bring in Matt Gorman and Joel Payne. Matt is a former campaign aide to Mitt Romney and Jeb Bush, and of course a Republican strategist. And Joel is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. Good to see you both. Uh, Joel, let me start off with you. Uh, we are seeing a very diverse lineup of voices at this year's convention. Uh, who are some of the key speakers and what will you be watching for, especially tonight? Well, I'm going to be watching for, you know, how the Democratic Party has really adjusted to this virtual world. Usually, you know, we have the pomp and circumstance and the balloons and the large crowds. We're not going to have any of that. What we are going to have, however, is a lot of high caliber speeches, not just tonight, but all through the week. Normally, you'll get a big keynote in the middle of the week from someone like a Barack Obama in 2004, who was a rising star, or, you know, the, Demo the Republican v v uh, VP nominee in 2008, Sarah Palin, right? That was a star turn moment for her. We'll see if we have those this year. Year. I know Democrats are planning a big rollout of a lot of new voices on Wednesday, led by Stacey Abrams. It'll look different. It'll feel different. But let's see if it has the same impact. One more question to you, Joe, before I move to Matt. One of the speakers we'll be seeing tomorrow is Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The DNC is expecting to air a 60-second pre-recorded message filmed by the Congresswoman from her home. So as the Democratic Party continues its ideological shift to the left, um, how is the party attempting to appeal to some more progressive voters, um, and are they doing enough to do that? Well, look, I certainly think that the Biden campaign has done a lot to bring progressives into the big tent um, on their campaign. As I've told you before, Vlad, um, you know, that plan that Joe Biden released, his economic plan about a month ago, that was really built in concert with Elizabeth Warren and her policy advisors. He's built these councils on his campaign where he's working with progressives like Alexandria ocasio Cortez and Bernie Sanders and, you know, folks who are supporters of them. So I think the efforts being made, this the, the convention this week is another opportunity to, to underscore that. But um, look, uh, I think Democrats are all united to beat Donald Trump in November, and then they can kind of have it out after November, after Joe Biden's president. Uh, all right, Matt, your turn. Uh, starting today, as you know, the president will hold some of his own events uh, this week. He'll be doing some in-person stops in three swing states, including Wisconsin, where the DNC is, of course, being hosted. The president is also rolling out a multi-million dollar digital ad campaign Explain the strategy here and what is the message? I think it was interesting. The president did several interviews uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. And oftentimes, even in friendly outlets like Fox News, he was asked what his policy proposals would be for another four years. In other words, why should Americans send him back to the Oval Office for four years? And he wasn't really able to articulate the message. What are you hearing from the campaign as to the message that they want people, their supporters, and the rest of the American people to get? I think you're right. Republicans I've talked to are concerned that there isn't that clear message, right? Whether you agree with it or not, we all knew what Donald Trump stood for in 2016, make America great again. And we all knew what action items he would do uh, when he would take office, rebuild the wall, step up the confrontation with China on trade. Whether you agree with it or not, you knew what he was going to do. They're searching for that message still. And I think you're right, as you mentioned, that rationale for the next four years, that is something that's tripped up many a politician. Um, the famous example was Ted Kennedy back when he challenged Jimmy Carter back in 1980. He needs to find that rationale. He needs to find clear action items and channel that like he did in 2016. And I think when it comes to the campaign rallies, he misses that. Certainly he misses the adoring crowds, the tens of thousands of people. And look at where he's going. Minnesota was a place he lost by about a point. That is somewhere that is getting uh, a more white working class in 2018, when Democrats took back the House and swept across the country, gaining a lot of House seats, we actually gained two seats in Minnesota in spite of it. So that is somewhere where I think if other avenues are closed off to him, so let's say if a Michigan or another state be, starts becoming out of reach, they're going to put more time, more money in a place like Minnesota to try and find another route to 270. Uh, uh, Matt and Joel, I just want to tell you and our viewers that we're awaiting some tape playback of the president of the United States. Uh, so we may 
ultimately have to cut this short uh, because we go to the president. But so I'm just letting you guys know. But um, Matt, let me ask you a question about uh, some reporting that I saw this weekend from uh, Olivia Nuzzi in New York Magazine writing about the campaign. One of the things that struck me about some of the people she profiled, including uh, the current campaign manager, Bill Shepian, who, who replaced Brad Parscale, although she reports a lot on Parscale, and she travels around um, in some of those battleground states um, to sort of see what the boots on the ground operation looks like. And I was struck, and I, you tell me if I'm wrong here, I was struck by the number of people who are associated with the campaign who are not s seemingly true believers in Donald Trump's vision for America. They seem to me to be folks who really want to win and who want to win um, and, uh, because they're all about the winning. But it strikes me that unlike in uh, past elections where you've had people, both Democrats and Republicans, who are not only invested in seeing their candidate win, but also invested in who that individual is, whether it's Barack Obama or Ronald Reagan or John F. Kennedy. And I wonder if you've seen sort of the same thing. I mean, a lot of these guys are good at what they do, a lot of these men and women, but it doesn't strike me that they believe in the vision of America that Donald Trump believes in. They just want to they just want to win and they just want to do really well and in Brad Parscale's case, I guess reportedly make a lot of money doing it. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I will say though, it, it, on, on the whole, if you want to make a lot of money, certainly don't get into politics. Um, but I, I can't speak to uh, Bill Stepping. He has a great reputation, and, and he comes very highly regarded working with Chris Christie and others along the way. Um, I, I will say, though, and I think this goes to Joel's point in, in, a, in an opposite way. He was saying how uh, progressives and Democrats are united by defeating Donald Trump. It doesn't need to be necessarily purely ideological. It can be, you know, sometimes against uh, going against a, a particular candidate on the opposing side. I think there are many ways to motivate not only your supporters, but also your staff. And I think every uh, presidential campaign, Republican or Democrat, working 18 hours a day is basically a half day. You're worth, that's, that's a pretty easy day. Um, so I think finding those ways to motivate yourself, whether that is uh, you're rallying against someone you, you know really believe in and maybe even adore, or really rallying against someone who you want to stop, uh, and an opponent. So I think there are mo many ways to get to the same place. Uh, Joel and Matt, I would love to keep this conversation going. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to have the president in just a little while, so we have to cut it short. But I really appreciate uh, your time. It's always great to have you. We'll be talking to you, I'm sure, over the next couple of days as uh, the Democratic convention kicks off. And of course, we'll be uh, back at it again next week for the Republicans. Thank you both very much. Thanks, Vlad. Likewise, thanks. All right, as we mentioned, CBSN's coverage continues throughout the day, and there will be in-depth analysis each night starting at 5 p.m. Eastern with Red and Blue, of course, anchor Elaine Keanu, and the team will continue coverage at 8.30, reporting on the issues that matter most to voters ahead of the November election.